thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Um, so my name is Rebecca Rogers. Uh, I actually first got involved with CEE because uh, I, I went to RSI in 2001 and then um, met a lot of really wonderful, great friends. And there's a huge alumni network of people who still work in science and engineering and, and in tech. And, and so I've stayed involved in the program and I've taught the biology class at RSI for several years and also taught at USAPO. And, and I'm more than happy to do everything I can to support those programs because they were such a big part of my own scientific development. So I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Bioinformatics and Genomics at UNC Charlotte. And my lab works on how you get brand new gene sequences that weren't there before and how those new genes can either help animals adapt to new environments or potentially do bad things and explain why you get genetic diseases. So we work on mutations that produce what's called genetic novelty. How do you get new genes that weren't there before when you need new genes for adaptation? And people have discovered over time that there are certain types of mutations that are really good at getting you something new and cool and different that organisms can use to adapt. And these are the mutations that change larger chunks of DNA at once. Things like duplications, where you first had one copy of a gene and now you have two copies. And so you can kind of mess around with the extra copy like a spare part and then tinker with it to do something new and cool and different that maybe you need in your genome. And then natural selection will favor that gene. And there are different methods for creating those duplicate genes. You can mix and match pieces of genes and stick them together at random to see what they end up doing and whether or not those create new functions. And we often see signatures of natural selection on these chimeric genes. Or you can pick up a gene and you can move it to a different location. And sometimes this changes where the gene is turned on or where it's turned off either during development or in different tissues. And so these are all different types of mutations that can produce innovation when you need it. The mutations occur at random and then natural selection uses what it finds useful. But some of these mutations happen to be useful when organisms need to adapt to new environment. And we over and over again find stories that these types of mutations really matter. So I work in a department of bioinformatics and genomics, and we often get the question of what is bioinformatics? Bioinformatics technically is anything that has lots of information and data analysis that's related to biology. These days, most bioinformatics programs are focused on genome sequence analysis in at least some way. So my group uh, gets genome sequences for different animals. We try to identify these types of mutations and how they form new genes. And then we try to see if we observe signatures of natural selection acting to make them spread through the population really quickly or acting on them to try to remove them from the population, which is a sign that they're doing something bad. So these are a double-edged sword of things that could do good things or could do bad things, but they're le slightly less likely to do um, just nothing important at all compared to other types of mutations. And so we're interested in how they contribute to evolutionary innovation. So how did I get here? So I, I grew up in a town called Florence, Alabama, and it's on the Tennessee River. Um, it's right across the river from a place called Muscle Shoals, which now is famous for a recording studio that was there, the Fame Recording Studio. There are documentaries about it now. Um, but, but it's a relatively small town uh, with a local university and, and, um, uh, and, and along this river. And, and so I grew up in this town. I always wanted to do math and science. And I, I got some of my first real hands-on lab experiences in, in genetics at RSI. That was one of the first times that I had ever been able to do genetic work. But when I was there, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a scientist and the opportunities that I found, my ISAF science projects and my, my formerly Intel SDS, now Regeneron SDS projects, were all done on freshwater bivalves. Muscle Shoals is a hotbed of diversity for freshwater bivalves and freshwater mussels. And these are important for the ecosystems of freshwater environments, but they're also going extinct in droves throughout the Southeast. So I did some science fair projects on, on the washboard mussel and um, 
and some factors related to reproduction and how many offspring they What's have. What's going on with Elixir? Sorry? Oh, it's good. I okay. All right. Uh, so I, I did some projects on, on the washboard muscle and, and how it produces offspring and, and how likely it is to spawn in the fall um, in collaboration with a professor, Tom Haggerty, who is at the local university. But the whole time, I really, really wanted to do genetics. So uh, I ended up going to the University of Georgia. And since this is a virtual meeting with people from Florida, I feel it's safe to say, go dogs. I don't know if I would say that in person. Um, but I ended up joining the lab of a guy named Rich Meager, who worked in plant genetics. He was one of the people who very early on in his career, before people could actually do genome sequencing like we do now, he sequenced a thousand base pairs and everyone around him thought he was just amazing because you had to do the sequencing process through this painful matter of, of cutting things with enzymes that cut specific sequences and running gels and then working the jigsaw puzzle to stick things back together with one another. Um, and, and see, you know, figure out the puzzle of what the genome sequences were. By the time I joined his lab, he had a project where we were working on a gene family. So different copies of gene sequences that were all formerly from one single ancestor gene. They had been copied and then changed just a bit so that they did similar things, but in slightly different contexts. So we were working on phosphate transporters that pull phosphate into plants. And in the gene family, there were some that specialized in the roots to get the phosphate out of the soil. Others specialized in pulling the phosphate from the water that comes up into the plant, into the leaves, and others that specialized in, in putting them into the pollen. And so we were working on some of the functions of how these phosphate transporters func um, ended up doing their jobs in the different tissues in the cells, how different they were. And he was working on some more practical problems of how to genetically engineer those transporters in that gene family so that they could pull toxins out of the soil when there was pollution. And so that was some of the first, um, the first project that I got to work on for an extended period of time, trying to do molecular genetics and PCR and cloning and some of the genetic tools that we now use very often. I really liked the work on the gene families, and I was really interested in how you got evolutionary innovation. And I ended up switching my senior year to get more bioinformatics experience in the lab of this guy named Jeff Benetton. And he worked on these types of mutations that I now work on too. And he also works a lot on selfish genetic elements, um, these virus-like things called transposable elements. They copy themselves, whether it's good for the host or not and they sp try to spread like viruses throughout the genome. And we have tons of those in our genome, but maize also has lots of these transposable elements in their genome. And in maize, they're very active and they move things around and they copy gene sequences all the time. And it's a very dynamic genome. So that was my first taste of the type of genetics work that I wanted to do, was working in his lab. And he got some very early genome sequence data for whole genomes that I was able to work with. Um, and, and do larger data sets. When it came time to decide where to go to grad school, I knew I wanted to work on this same topic, but there was one problem with doing plant gen genetics, and that's that I have terrible allergies, and every time I went into the greenhouse, um, my nose would swell shut, and, and I'd have to pop a few Claritin, and it, it just seemed like a difficult way to do your grad school work. So when I was deciding on labs, I picked a lab that ended up working on fruit flies, and it was in the lab of Dan Hartle at Harvard, uh, he's one of the masterminds of Drosophila population genetics, uh, especially the evolutionary genetics of trying to tell which things natural selection likes and causes to spread through the population, and which things it doesn't care about, and which things it acts against. So he had this background in theory, he'd been working with fruit flies for decades, he'd made some important discoveries about duplications and TEs, and how they can create new genes, and I knew that I wanted to go to his lab and I specialized in these genes in the, the bottom left-hand corner, the chimeric genes. And so I found plenty of cases where natural selection was acting on these new genes. So you've got a piece of one gene and a piece of another gene, and you randomly stick them together. And most of the time, that just produces garbage. But every once in a while, it would produce something new and cool that caused the change that the animal needed. And we could observe signatures of natural selection on those genes more often than anyone had ever expected. So that's what I did for my PhD thesis. 
eventually it got easier to sequence other organisms. And I ended up moving for a postdoc with Monty Slatkin at Berkeley, who did a lot of computational genomics. And he was one of the theory experts who got involved in ancient DNA sequencing. So there was a lab in Leipzig, Germany, Svante Pavo, who's very, very famous for being the person who first got whole genome sequencing out of Neanderthals. The sequence data isn't as good as what we can get from fruit flies, and part of Monty's lab's work was trying to put limits on what you could say from a small number of individuals working in ancient DNA. When I was in his lab, I did my kind of work where we found examples of new gene formation. This is one that appears with expression in the testes, and it's different between Neanderthals and humans. A piece of the Y chromosome moved over to um, one of the regular cr chromosomes, chromosome 10, and when it did, it formed a brand new gene sequence that amplified in Neanderthals. When I did my work on fruit flies, we and other people had found that a lot of new genes that form are active in the male germline. And we, we knew how the bioinformatics worked because we had all this experience working with genome sequence data for fruit flies. So then we could walk into these messy genomes of Neanderthals that weren't as high quality, and we could still work with them because we knew what worked and what didn't based on our work using fruit flies as model organisms. So in fruit flies, we find new genes and we find cases where they form and we find signatures of natural selection. And we find that they're often active in the male um, reproductive tissue, that they're very important for the function of the testes. In Neanderthals, we found lots of mutations that were active in the testes. So here in these two completely different animals, we see a general principle of new gene formation that is associated with male reproduction. And other people in other groups had found that even in plants, new gene formation is more often found in the pollen, in the male germline, than in the ovules, the female germline. And it's kind of a puzzle about exactly what is happening here, how much is mutation, how much is selection for new genes that act in the sperm, how much is that you can just mess around with sperm and they're disposable because you have more, uh, you know, a few million more along with those. But here, by working on different animals with completely different biology and working on the same mutations in those different animals, we can find these general principles associated with new gene formation and identify these cases of innovation that are important for our own um, genomes and, and the ways that we have changed over time in our species. But the, the part of my work that I really want to feature today that uh, I think is interesting is one study that I did also on ancient DNA for woolly mammoths. And as I mentioned before, these mutations often in, end up doing, some of them do nothing at all. They're just mistakes that appear in the genome. Some of them just by accident do something new and cool and useful that the animal needs. But sometimes these mutations can also do bad things. And we think they're less likely to be neutral impacts than the other types of mutations that can appear in the genome. So somebody ended up releasing genome sequence data for woolly mammoths. I worked in a lab that worked on ancient DNA, and I worked with Monty Slatkin, who had this expertise in the theory and computational methods that you needed to use to analyze ancient DNA. And so I ended up working on, on this woolly mammoth genome. And, um, and we found some things that we think are really important for evolutionary theory. So woolly mammoths, originally lived in, um, in northern uh, North America and Siberia, and at the height of their range, they stretched all the way into Europe and down into northern China. And they, they were grazers that ended up foraging on the open plains. They ate grass. They had these flat teeth that had plate-like grooves on them, and they ground up grasses. And that was different from mastodons, which have very pointy teeth, and they can crunch on twigs and leaves. The mammoths had to have grassland space in order to survive. And as grazers, sort of like the bison that are in the, the um, Midwest of the United States, they ended up defining the landscape around them. They ate the grasses and kept the vegetation in a certain state, and, and then their impacts on the territory also defined the landscape in return. 
eventually the climate started to change. And when it did, trees started to grow up over the Siberian steppe. So what used to be wide open grassland was now a habitat that they couldn't inhabit as easily. And it was also likely that they didn't cope quite as well um, in, in the warmer environments. So this was no longer suitable habitat for the woolly mammoths. Alongside that, there were these pesky humans that spread into Europe and, and into Siberia and into the Americas, and they ended up hunting the woolly mammoths. And on mammoth specimens, I've read, you can find spear marks that target the cheekbone of woolly mammoths, and they will have marks on the skulls of the woolly mammoths that can't be imitated well through any other means other than a sharp object trying to pierce them. So if you want, there is an artery that runs across the cheek of elephants and mammoths, and it's the main artery that's the blood supply for the trunk. Other animals have a similar blood vessel, but you know, we don't have a trunk, no matter how big your nose is, it's not a trunk and, it, and you don't need an, a massive artery to bring the blood supply to that trunk. But the elephants do, and they have this enlarged artery that runs across their cheek. And if you can hit that artery, it is one of the few ways to take an elephant or a mammoth down quickly. And the people that spread into Europe and Siberia tens of thousands of years ago, had learned this thing about the mammoth biology. And if you could hit that, it was one way to bring down the elephant quickly so no one in the hunting party gets injured that day, and also to make sure that you actually have something to eat. And long before you can actually find artifacts of any human presence in that part of Siberia, you can find these marks on the skulls of, of woolly mammoths that were hunted. And so they're an indirect indicator of human presence and human spread across Siberia. There are also, of course, Colombian mammoths that some of you may be familiar with, um, where in Los Angeles there are the tar pits where Colombian mammoths who live further south ended up getting trapped in the tar, and they've been able to recover whole skeletons for multiple individuals to look at diversity in populations and how it was different over time and how many individuals were likely to be in the area. In Siberia, there were also Arctic explorers who ended up finding woolly mammoths frozen in the ice with skin still on their bones and, and with fur still on the skin in some places. As you go forage across Siberia, you can find sometimes these mammoths that are still, you know, freeze dried but fairly well intact. And so these are animals that have a very significant paleontological record. We have lots of, they're not, they're not considered true fossils like dinosaurs, but we have lots of records of their bones. We know a lot about their diversity. We know where they lived. We know what they looked like because we can find these specimens still intact. And when I heard about this in elementary school, I thought that was about the coolest thing I'd ever heard in my life. It was the closest you could get to having a time machine to see this thing that lived tens of thousands of years ago before anyone you ever knew was ever alive and you could still see what it looked like. And I went home in kindergarten and I told my dad and my mom that I wanted to be a woolly mammoth explorer and go find them in Siberia. And then my parents sat me down and had a talk with me about how to go get a real job and support yourself because woolly mammoth explorer just isn't gonna, gonna cut it with the, with the salary that they get. And so I moved on with my life and, and made them proud by becoming an evolutionary geneticist. But then one day, a really exciting thing happened, which is that Eleftheria Pacapolo and Lova Dahlen at the Swedish Museum of Natural History published genome sequence data for two mammoths. One was a juvenile individual that came from 40,000 years ago that was identified on the mainland, and it was one of these that was found with the, with the tissue still intact. And then the other comes from a tooth that was found on a place called Wrangell Island. And they got high quality, high coverage genome sequence data, almost as good as the Neanderthals for these two different specimens. And I had wanted to work on woolly mammoths for my whole life. And I went to coffee with a friend, actually Boris Alexeyev, who's also an alum from RSI. And I told him about this and he said, well, it's fortunate that at least some of our kindergarten dreams actually can come true. So I started analyzing the genome sequence data and truth be told, I didn't really know what I was gonna find but I thought it would be super cool to work on mammoths. And we ended up finding this story written in the genome, written in the DNA sequences, that told a story about the woolly mammoths and their decline. That was interesting if you have always been the kid that wanted to work on mammoths, but it's also interesting for those of us 
who are interested in, in evolutionary theory. All right, so Wrangell Island is off the north coast of Siberia. It is a very cold and bleak place. Um, it's often hit by Arctic cyclones, and, and because cyclones hit it and it's so cold, it's so awful to live there that trees can't even grow up on the island. And that sounds like a place you don't want to build your summer home, but for the mammoths, this was in fact a great habitat. It was far enough from the mainland that it was very dangerous for humans to get there. And they didn't arrive until around 3,700 years ago, coincidentally around the same time that the mammoths on the island went extinct. But because trees could not grow up on the island, there was some, some small patch of grassland and a few um, you know, scrubby plants and bushes that they could forage on. And this ended up being a protected habitat for the mammoths, where they ended up surviving another 6,000 years after everything on the mainland has gone extinct. So there's this small population of mammoths hanging out on this island. There are none of them left on the mainland, and they're chilling out here, and then humans finally get to the island, and they, there's no direct evidence that they hunted them to death, but it's an awful coincidence of when they arrived. When they got to the island, the mammoths on the island were actually smaller than what you would see on the mainland. They weren't true dwarfs. They were about 10 feet tall instead of 14 feet tall. Um, and we know that small elephants will sometimes appear in populations, and they do really badly, especially if they're male. The petite elephants often get driven out of the herd. They get beat up. If you have one in the zoo, um, then you have to keep it separate from the other elephants so that, so that it doesn't get hurt, which is a little unfortunate. But there is actually a principle of repeated island dwarfism in mammoths and elephants. Elephants and mammoths repeatedly invaded different islands so long as they were close to the shore of the mainland. And when they did, they repeatedly got smaller. In the Channel Islands um, off the coast of California, close to LA, there were six foot tall woolly mammoths or Columbian mammoths. And then on the island of Crete, there were four foot tall mammoths. And some people think the legend of the Cyclops actually comes from finding the elephant skulls where the, there's a hole where the trunk would go and they interpreted that as being a giant with a single eye. But there were these cute little petite little mammoths hanging out on those islands too. These were not quite as small, but they were definitely smaller. One of the questions we often get is how did the mammoths get to the island? And the answer is we're not totally sure. There's some debate about how big the ice sheets were at different points in time as the climate warmed. Could the mammoths walk across only in winter? Um, we know that around 14,000 years ago, they could go back and forth from the mainland to the island. And they, based on isotope ratios in the bones, you could track where they were foraging. And there are signatures of the isotopic ratios on the mainland and the island. By 12,000 years ago, the population was completely separate. There's also this debate of how far could a woolly mammoth swim in Arctic waters. So long as the waters are warm, elephants can swim up to 100 miles from the shore. Any island that's within 100 miles, they can get to. And they can swim 50 miles a day. They have phenomenal endurance. They float really well. And then they use their trunk like a snorkel if they need to. So there's sort of, no one thinks that elephants adapted to be able to go for a swim off the coast of the, the north of Siberia. But they, in fact, if they could have withstood the cold, would have been able to swim long distances to get to these different islands. Is that what hap happened in the Arctic? It could be that it was too cold. It could be that it was okay in the summer. And we're not totally sure, but it is one possibility and certainly a factor in other island invasions. So there's this island of mammoths and they're separated from the mainland in a very small population. And to put this time scale into perspective, at 3,700 years ago when they went extinct, Ur of the Chaldeans had risen and fallen. The pyramids have been put up in Egypt. They put up Stonehenge in England. In the Americas, they've domesticated maize. In the Arabian Peninsula, they domesticated horses. And I don't know why, but nobody ever domesticated a woolly mammoth and I'm kind of upset about it because if they had, we would still have them around. So they're isolated for, for another 6,000 years by themselves. And you can see the story of their isolation written in the DNA. 
on the y-axis of this graph is the size of the population at different time scales. On the right-hand side of the graph is far back in time. On the left-hand side of the graph is the closest time point to where we are today. And remember, there were two mammoths. The woolly mammoth that came from the mainland that died 40,000 years ago, its population size that it lived in was relatively healthy. It was around 15,000 individuals, which is better than we see for any elephant alive today. Um, and there were probably lots of them out roaming the open steppe. As the population sizes were smaller and isolated, you can see that genetic diversity drops and drops and drops because of these small population sizes. When you get small gene pools, you have less diversity and it's written in the genomes of these individuals. And we in fact know, even before we look at these graphs, that the mammoths went extinct. So we know this population is doomed. This was an interesting scenario if you work in evolution. There were theories that have been discussed of nearly neutral evolution. And to, to put it quite simply, it means that bad things happen when your population size gets small. If you have a small gene pool, you can have individuals that would be outcompeted in a big gene pool. If you have you know, 15,000 individuals in your population, then, then you know, you don't necessarily need for that one individual that looks a little strange to survive and reproduce and they get competed out. In a small gene pool, then just by chance, it may happen that that individual with some bad mutations ends up reproducing and you get bigger effects of random chance that's called genetic drift. And so there were these theories that said when population sizes are small, you should start to observe bad mutations accumulate. Most of that work was from a purely theoretical perspective. Some of it was from comparisons across species, but if you compare humans to bacteria, there could be lots of different factors that are causing those genomes to look different. Here we have the same species and we have a snapshot before and after the population size gets small. And so we can see what happens in the DNA. What we observed is that the island mammoth had lots of bad mutations. He had more deletions. He had a higher proportion of deletions that affect gene sequences and break them, more stop codons that would break gene sequences, and more retrogenes and more transposable elements, those virus-like things that we discussed earlier. And all in all, 50% more of his genes were broken in comparison with the with the mainland mammoths. Sorry, I lost my sharing. Excuse me, standard for Zoom. All right. So all of us have some bad mutations in our genomes. Most of them are recessive. So if we have one working copy of the gene, we're okay. But for all of you, if you were asked, do you want to have 50% more of your genes broken? And do you wanna have more of them completely deleted? And do you want to have more of them have both copies on both chromosomes deleted? I don't think anyone in the Zoom room would sign up for that. And so there was this excess of bad mutations in the island mammoths. One type of change that we saw is that the olfactory receptors and taste receptors had changed. We don't know exactly why. One possibility is that they met new plants on the island that they needed to eat, that they would have found icky before and they wouldn't want to eat their vegetables. But on the island, that's one of the few food sources. So they had to learn to eat non-preferred foods. Another possibility is that there weren't as many, we got it close now? Five Sorry. minutes, okay, good. We, that there weren't as many predators on the island and they didn't have to smell them coming. And so um, they just didn't need those genes anymore. And then the third possibility is that if you knock out a smell receptor, that mammoth is not going to drop dead. So it could be that it's doing okay, but not great. It would be better if it could smell things, but it's not going to be so terrible that if it, it will make the, the mammoth either die or, or completely fail to reproduce. And, and we don't know which of those factors, but we know that something was going on with these, with these receptors. Alongside that, there are these urinary proteins that, that are involved in social interactions. They're involved in mating, they're involved in social hierarchies. They're similar to what happens with dogs, you know, where their urinary proteins are part of their signaling and the same is true in mice. And so those same proteins that would have been picked up by the olfactory receptors were also degrading through time. 
So we have these two sets of related genes that were being deactivated in the mammoths, and it must have had some kind of impact on their biology, although it's hard to get complete precision. There was one mutation, though, that seemed really cool, and it was at the locus of a gene called FOXQ1. FOXQ1 is a transcription factor. It regulates where genes are turned on and turned off during development. And one of the places where it's active is when hairs are growing. And woolly mammoths were, of course, covered in hairs, and that was very important to keep them protected from the cold. If you delete this gene sequence, it had a deletion on one of the chromosomes, and then it had a stop codon that broke the gene on the other chromosome. So two different ways to break gene sequences at the same gene site, and that's some pretty bad luck. I mean, this mammoth had a lot of bad mutations, but that's still bad luck. So it would completely wreck the function of this gene. Part of what it does is produce the stiff inner core of hairs. And in most mammals, if you mutate this gene, they have a satin fur phenotype. So they shimmer and shine in the light. They're still the same color that they were before, but their hairs are translucent instead of opaque, and they're much softer. And so it would have compromised most likely part of their fur coat that protected them from the cold, but also made them nice and shiny. So this poor little mammoth has a lot of things going wrong in his DNA and 50% more of his genes are broken. And we can even look at his genome and find some things that look really, really bad that might have given him terrible diseases. But at least he was really, really ridiculously good looking. So now in my lab, uh, I, I have a lab where we're working on the same kinds of mutations that copy and, and move genes around the genome and how they produce new genes. And we want to know how are these same mutations affecting other animals? And I have a graduate student, Ritika Malik, who's look, looking at these virus-like transposable elements and how they can wreck genomes. And we're working on these in modern day elephants. So we're trying to get genome sequencing data from elephants from zoos. We've also got elephant bones that we've gotten from museums. And we're trying to look at how much that transposable element content has changed. Where are the duplications? Do we see any cases of new genes forming in Asian elephants? And how have their genomes degraded as they become endangered in the wild? We're looking for other species as well that are um, experiencing uh, either extinction or under threat. And as it turns out, our freshwater bivalves from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, it, in my hometown, it's a hotbed of diversity for these species. But we know that throughout the Southeast and Northern America, that 70% of freshwater bivalve species are becoming endangered and extinct. And in the past 100 years, in the lifetime of living individuals or, or two individuals, multiple species have completely disappeared from the wild. There are populations that used to be extremely common with millions of individuals, and now those populations have crashed because of pollution, because of invasive species like Asiatic clams and zebra mussels, um, because of human encroachment, because they fish them out of the river to turn them into pearls. And so we want to know what's happening in their genome. So I'm also living my other, other um, dream of generating reference genomes for these freshwater bivalves. We already have a reference genome for my favorite, Megaloniaus nervosa, that I use for my ISEF projects. We've collected 12 other or 15 other species that we're also trying to sequence to see what's happening in their genome as they have become threatened and endangered. Are they accumulating bad mutations or are there other new genes that are appearing that help them to adapt to these new selective pressures that have showed up as humans have invaded their environment? So that I think brings us to full circle of the types of things my lab does where we study these same types of mutations in an evolutionary context in different species to try to see if when they matter for adaptation and when they do bad things to genomes in the wild. All right, so that I hope I didn't run too far over. Ah, no, you were great. We have a few time, a little bit of time for- Yeah, no, we have, uh, yeah, we definitely have some questions. Um, so what first question is, um, is there any sort of correlation that you can see or others have seen between sort of the various types of population pressures that pressures that might be on a population of species and the types of mutations that occur. Right. So in in the freshwater bivalves, we know that they've been affected by pollution. And then when we generated the genome sequence, we were 
at first I thought we were just going to generate a genome sequence and we were going to send it out to the world and some of the bigger projects would come later. But when we looked at the genome, there were all these genes that were duplicating in the detox genes. And so it was like the genome had turned on a Xerox to make extra copies of everything that acts in detox. And we know that this river was really polluted. They used to spray it every single summer with DDT to get rid of the mosquitoes. There's also runoff from pesticides in the cotton farms nearby and, and some pollution from industry. And these freshwater bivalves can take a ton of pollution and still survive. And one of the ways that they do that is most likely by getting extra copies of the detox genes. So we, we have, um, we have a, a, a little bit more than a dozen of these genes. Mice have some place, I think around 23. And then these freshwater bivalves, we found 140 something of them in their genome. So, so we do see changes that reflect their biology. We go into it agnostic and we see what we find, what's amplifying, where do we find the signatures of natural selection? And that care tells us what the animal cares about. But we certainly see things that fit with their environment and the pressures. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so another question is, um, so they recently, there was recent news about the, the chameleon that was found in Madagascar after 100 years, mm -hmm. um, again. And I get curious to know, um, you know, if they, I know, especially in Madagascar, some, some of those animals are very hard to find, but I guess, yes. is that indicative of um, sort of small populations and potentially um, yes. mutations that are very, that are detrimental to their species? Right. So there are people who have worked for decades on mass extinctions and, and island species seem to be very vulnerable whenever you bring in another similar species from the mainland, they get outcompeted easily. And some people have hypothesized that it's because of the small population sizes. People now have the ability, it's become so much easier to sequence any animal that you want to, that there are ongoing studies across, you know, everything from cheetahs to probably the chameleons, the lemurs. Um, people have actually gotten fruit flies from Madagascar and from other islands to see how different their genomes are. Um, and so those are open questions that people are studying now. Um, and we, we certainly expect to see very different things in, in different island environments or anytime you get a small population. It's a very active field of work in conservation. Awesome. Um, and so for a more fun question, mm -hmm. um, so if you had a like really good sample of mammoth DNA, could you basically Jurassic Park it with modern elephants? So there, there are people who claim that they can clone a mammoth. There's a, a colleague named Beth Shapiro who's at UC Santa Cruz and she wrote a book called How to Clone a Mammoth. And the punchline is that you don't. Um, it's very difficult to get high enough quality DNA even from the frozen samples and repair it. You can get some fragments, but it's not intact enough to do the cloning tricks that you would do on something that's alive right now. There is a guy at Harvard named George Church and he has taken elephant cells and he has used CRISPR to modify the elephant cells and make them more mammoth-like. He claims that he's going to use this to make a mammoth and then the ethics boards told him that he can't do this by using an elephant female as a surrogate because they're endangered and it's too risky and there's too much chance of something going wrong with both the mother and with, with the mammoth. He's now said that he's going to build an artificial womb for the mammoth and it's only five years away. It was also only five years away when I was in graduate school in 2006. Mm -hmm. So we'll see when he actually shows up and does it. But there are people who are working on, on creating mammoth-like things um, and, and certainly people that are probably going to try in the near future, whether we want them to or not. So someone else, we were also curious to know if, um, if all of your work is fo focused on endangered species. Um, so these days we, we have some um, funded work that's working on fruit flies where we're still doing fundamental genetics. And we want to find the new genes that help them invade new environments. They happen to be on islands at the moment. Um, and we're surveying to see if you see lots of brand new genes that end up being important and favored by natural selection when you invade a new environment on different islands. And so we've, we've got different islands off the coast of Africa. They were originally in the mainland of Africa, then they spread all over the world. Uh, and we're looking at different species of fruit flies and how they adapt. But um, as we branch out to other species, one of the questions we want to look at 
it's what's happening in endangered species. And it doesn't matter how many members you have in your population, the bivalves are going extinct, but there are still in what are considered small populations of bivalves, there are probably more individuals than what we see in all of the Asian elephants in the world. And so does that matter in terms of the math and the evolutionary theory and, and some, of the, um, some of the questions that are related to things that used to be purely math papers? We think we have a hope of addressing by looking at these different species. We'll see what else comes up next. Um, I keep talking about if we could get clinical samples for humans, it would be really interesting to see what these same mutations are doing in that context. Um, and I've had some, some rotation students explore it, so that could happen in the future as well. Oh, that's very interesting. One last super fun question. Besides woolly mammoths, which other extinct species would you like to study? Oh, great question. Which other species would I like to study? At, it's funny, at the moment, there, there are all of these extinct species that people have started to get DNA out of, and we're sort of awash in, in all of them. Um, that it, it's hard to almost make up your mind beyond what's being flooded at you. There, there are genome sequences for woolly rhinoceroses. There are some extinct horse breeds that they've also gotten DNA out of. Dire wolves would probably be pretty cool. Um, one of the things I've talked to a colleague about when we were both daydreaming about new projects, we're both too busy to pick any new projects. That's not allowed, especially right now. Um, but, but there are species like the devil's hole pupfish where there are so few individuals alive that they know every single one, or this blind cave fish in Alabama back home, where they're on the brink of extinction and they have been in a small population for so long, what's happening with them? And those would be really interesting, both in terms of evolution and, and working on endangered species. Awesome, thank you. Um, Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, wonderful. We're so pleased to have you, um, and especially since we're virtual, because um, we're never, we're never, we're not in North Carolina. We can finally have you speak to to an audience. Absolutely. So we're thrilled.